in and fill the paper with the message that it wants to send. Hello and welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker. My guest today is a pilot, writer, and photographer who edits an aviation magazine called Air Sport for the Australian Sport Aircraft Association. Her first book, Australian Women Pilots, Amazing True Stories of Women in the Air, the Aviatrix Book Club discussion book for April 2021, is a compilation of 10 stories ranging from the first Australian woman to operate with her commercial pilot license through current day aviation women pioneers. You can find her at her website, kathymexted.com. Let's talk a little bit more about writing and then and then we'll wrap things up. Um, when we were talking, uh, when you popped into the book club, you were talking about, you know, you've done a lot of journalism. And so you weren't writing a full uh, biography about any one of these women that you wrote about in this book, but it, they weren't magazine articles either. And so there was some some tweaking that you had to do to your own writing to sort of round them out enough um, for these stories. Talk a little bit about that. Like, how did you get there? Tell me about that, that kind of writing for you. So um, mostly with a magazine article, you're aiming for 800 words. I write for a magazine called Outback Magazine in Australia. And they're very professional. They're wonderful to write for um, and work with. And they are very have a very clear layout. And they say it has to fit under one of the set headings that we have when you pitch a story to them. And then when they commission the story, they go, right, 800 words, five photos, three, one photo, whatever. And so you know exactly what you're doing. They have very set writing style. And one of the things I was taught at uni and which they... Um, carry on with that mag with the magazine is not to put yourself in the story because you're it's not your story like you're not you're nothing you're just telling the story so um so I always tell the story from um like once removed so I'm telling the story without ever you knowing who I am you know um so I also have to cut it down. Normally you'll write the story and it'll be 1,500, 2,000 words and then you just edit, 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 cut out whatever's not necessary. So it's quite a skill to write short. And um, so when I started writing the book, I started with Pat Tool, and I started her story with the gun. I op the opening line was, um, <clears throat> you know, blah, 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 so they gave her a gun. And I thought it was a great opening line, but my friend said, <laughs> she said, it sounds like a magazine story. <laughs> she said, you've got to introduce the person and you've got to tell us where we are and you've got to, you know, she said, it's Kathy, you've got, you're writing a book, not a magazine article. And she said, it sounded like a magazine. She said, you're writing a book. You've got 7,000 words. What are you going to do with all those words? And so I sent her probably um, what I'd written and she took or I sent her maybe, I don't know, the first thousand words or something and she just rewrote it or, or wrote across it in red pen, you know, and said, you could write that like this. So the problem was I was giving the facts and it ends up sounding a bit like a school project as one other magazine editor told me well she goes this reads like a school project and it's because I was scared of my own voice and so I had to learn to narrate the story yeah so um <clears throat> I can remember so Kristen Alexander is the girl from she's from Canberra and she writes World War II aviation stories so look her up um yeah. And she just rewrote part of it. I think it was the bit about Pat living in the men's hut, how she, um, Bob, though Bob employed her to bring the men down to the line, down to earth, um, he couldn't, couldn't, uh, he couldn't avoid having to house her separately. And, and I thought, oh, that's very different to how I had written it the first time. And she has, that's her narrating that story. And so when I read the beginning of Pat's story, I can very strongly see Kristen's um, influence there. 
not through the rest of it, but just in parts. And so um, also the editor said to me, when once the book was done, she said, you've got to put yourself into the story. And I said, I've spent 10 years taking myself out of the story. And she said, no, but sometimes the fact that you can relate to that experience or the fact that you were there or you've done the same thing, it just adds weight to um, to the situation. So occasionally, I think two or three occasions, I've put myself in just where I've got a comment. Yeah. yeah. Or, or sometimes I would say when I interviewed them in whatever, or by that time they were gone and I couldn't find the logbook and so we have to assume blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, I could see that. Um, I, I could see that come through. I also maybe saw where you were very careful to say when you were doing this, but where you were filling in what you imagined the conditions to be like somewhere, you know, like, yeah, you know, I wasn't there, but this is what it would have looked like or felt like. And I really enjoyed that descriptive because it, yeah. it did fill out the picture, you know, where you wouldn't yeah. be able to glean all of that in trying to write an article and just doing it in a journalistic style. So I thought that was, really yeah, it was fun. quite nice in the end. And, um, and to be able to comment on their character, like I think I wrote in Lynn Gray's story, Lynn laughs. She laughs a lot anyway, but she laughs at that comment. It was about when she met her husband and she got the knife and just cut off the patch off his jacket. Yeah. And um, he said, I collected patches and he had one I hadn't seen before. <laughs> so she borrowed his pocket knife and hacked off the thing. And, um, and I said to her, was that a bit brash? And she said, ah, he had a knife and he was going to stand still, you know. She said, it's not like I was hacking at his clothing. <laughs> yeah. So they went out for lunch and then they got married. <laughs> That's just great. Um, so then you, like, you, you talked earlier about the sort of interchange that you had about the book, um, about the pilot's wives that didn't, they weren't really ready for. And was it the same publisher that you went to with this project, uh, asking to get a publisher? Yeah. How did the publishing process work for you? Yeah. So I had a lady who was extremely helpful and who helped me also with the, like a professional lady who helped me with that Pat's Tool story as well. So I spent eight months working on that story. And then she said, I think you're right. So then I did Nancy, that took me three months. And she said, yep, that's okay, off you go. And so then I wrote the rest of the book. Um, and she was trying to find a publisher, but she just, she said the publishing industry in Australia anyway, just sort of went over a cliff. And I got very frustrated. By the time I'd written the ninth story, I was just, I said to her, look, thanks for everything. And she said, I've done my best, but I'm just having no luck. And she said, try one of the smaller publishers. Like I got to the point where, I just I had to get rid of it, you know. It, I, I didn't care. I thought if I can't find a publisher, I'm just going to print a hundred of them and give them away, you know, sell them out of the boot of the car. Wow. So um, I went to a like a writer's day and they had a publisher there and she talked about how their best selling book last the year before was about space, Dr. Space Junk versus the universe. And she said, so if anyone's got a book on space in them, and I went, I'm writing aviation stories. Should I put a space story in there to make it more marketable? And she went, oh, I think she thought I didn't look like someone who was going to, that's not what she expected. I don't know what I look like, a middle-aged housewife. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> she went, I'm very interested in talking to you. And so she was the lady who gave me the contract. Um, so I got out of it pretty lightly. Um, Otherwise, I would have had to go and find all the smaller publishers. That's fabulous. I mean, I think that's that speaks a lot to um, to the idea of attending those kinds of workshops and opportunities and doing that kind of networking. You know, just putting yeah. yourself in positions where you will be exposed to someone who might be interested. That's great. I'm glad things work yeah. out for you that way. Yeah. The same with. Um, like Kristen, who helped me, and Annabelle, who's another lady, and Helene, the three women three women writers who I thank in the acknowledgements. Each of them I just met. Kristen I met because she emailed me asking me to review a book of hers. 
and we became good friends. I went to meet her when I was in Canberra next. Annabelle wrote for Outback magazine and I just emailed her one day and said, oh, I see you in Outback all the time and I'm up the back, you know. And so we became great mates after that. And Helene was the same. Somebody else said, oh, if you write aviation, you should meet Helene Young. So I just found her on Twitter. And yeah, it's you've got to um, sort of take a deep breath and realise that everybody's, we're all just people, you know. Yeah, and if people I think, don't respond, uh, well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I mean, but I think, um, you know, I think that that's what the, what is really kind of fun right now about meeting the other women writers in aviation because you know uh, I'm hearing I'm hearing about people who have written biographies um, and the ways in which that they got them published and you know if a university press in the United States is willing to publish that book they might be willing to publish another like it and just having those connections and networking and understanding how well how did you go about it and you know, it's all the networking. I just think it's a really neat um, yeah. opportunity for us to not only connect on a personal level because we all sort of share both of these interests of writing and aviation, but also our networks and our audiences too. Because if yeah. somebody was interested in reading about the Australian women pilots, they may be interested, you know, after reading that about reading other stories about the air transport auxiliary or, or stories about the women air service pilots in the United States in World War II, or, you know, you can, you can translate that to any one of these given adventures, uh, you know, the, the pilots who were fl flying at the same time in the 1920s and 30s in the United States when Nancy Bird Walton was flying, like, there are so many stories mm -hmm. about them. So, so you have this book, you have an audience, and, you know, we have other authors who um, have written books that cover similar topics. Well, a reader who likes one might be interested in knowing about the others. So that's something that we can do, I think, for each other is to, to kind of cross, cross promote, you know, because yeah. it's not this it's not like a zero sum game. Nobody just reads one book in their life. right? No. <laughs> you know, and it's like, not a competition. <laughs> it's not a it's not a competition it's it's not it's wonderful um so yeah. anyway well that, that's how i met you liz wasn't it i just responded to your facebook post yeah yeah and i think you I need mean, my book you said yes i do yeah <laughs> it was great i did i did need your book because i was trying to get as much diversity as can be found in terms of flying experience and international, you know, global perspective. And you certainly covered like the wide range of things. And, and then I also <laughs> wanted fiction and nonfiction and historical and contemporary. You've got both the historical yeah. and the contemporary in there. So yeah, you covered a lot of those bases. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's good. I, I tell you what I did um, after our chat the other day, I last night I went to Boone County, Kentucky to the library site and I found my book in their catalog and I emailed them. I screenshotted it and sent it to the girls in the book and said, just that I'd let you know this happened. And, um, and then I emailed the library in Boone County, Kentucky, wherever that is. Um, well, I know where it is now, I looked it up and said, if you're interested in a Zoom talk, I'm happy to do a Zoom talk. <laughs> so I'm gonna have like sister city, I'm gonna become, I love it. And that's all thanks Honor to Lori Miklos. <laughs> an honorary gonna... citizen of Boone County, Kentucky. I just love the name. It just sounds so, it's, I don't know, it's, Daniel Boone. It, it is the way it sounds. <laughs> that's fantastic. The, the way she said it with that accent, Boone, Boone County, Kentucky. <laughs> I don't know, I can't do it, but it was great. Shout out to Lori Miklos. That's so great. How funny. <laughs> So what else do we need? What else? What would you like any writer to know who wants to embark on on an, a biographical story of somebody else, either contemporary or historical, in in about women in aviation? Um, my hot tip would be to find somebody who is alive, <laughs> and so that way you can get lots of information about them, and they can tell you who to go and talk to. Or as with Pat Toole, her family were very helpful because even though she passed away two weeks later, she had done 
um, her talk from the conference, she'd given that same talk at an aero club and somebody had put it on YouTube. So I could go back and recount. Amazingly, nobody recorded the talk at the conference, but I had the basics on the YouTube and she had written a book of her own. So she had um, like just notes, it wasn't ever published. So I had it in her own words and the people around her still could give me information. So the more sources that you've got, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Sarah Byrne Rickman is a woman here in the States who um, she just she used to be a journalist. She used to be the editor of a newspaper, and she um, had the good fortune to just happen to live in the city where the women air service pilots. I'm getting the name wrong, but the the women's museum for um, women during World War II moved into that town and contacted her, and she had always been interested in aviation anyway. She ended up retiring um, from the, the paper and working with them. And she has written 11 books or 10 or 11 books wow. about women because yeah. she, in your same situation, she was sitting in one of their, their Thursday night talks or whatever. And this woman was telling a story and he was like, she was like, where's the, where's the video camera? Who's recording this? And she yeah. was like, these need to be recorded for posterity. And she has just immersed herself in their world for the past 20 years, has flown yeah. with them. And um, yeah, so I think that's yeah. really neat. If you yeah, what a gift. It, yeah. Um, it's also a great, time to encourage people to record stories that is a great point and now that all the world war ii pilots have died off but when i started writing about 10 years ago they were all the ones that were left were approaching about 90 yeah and i interviewed an australian guy who flew mosquitoes in world war ii in england and someone said to me it's fantastic that you've done that interview because he won't be around much longer and of course he's not and none of them are and this journalist said to me, there's a real scramble now to try and find these guys and, and get, their, um, get their stories. Another tip would be <clears throat> never take somebody's personal papers, definitely not their logbook. If you want something to read or record, take your phone and photograph it. Because many times I've um, asked them, where's such and such? And they go, oh, I gave it to some journalist who was going to write a story I've never seen it since and so logbooks go missing letters go missing things yeah so for the families hold on tight either put them in a museum or hold on tight to your stuff yeah just copy it all and give it to them on a memory stick <laughs> yeah that's a really that's a really good point wow yeah that's unfortunate I can see how that happens is there anything else? If you're gonna write a book, um, do a writing course. So learn how a book goes together. Network with other writers. Start going to book writing events or book, uh, do, you have, um, do you have book festivals, like writers festivals? We sure there? do. We have festivals, yeah. conferences, all kinds of societies, depending on what kind of writing you yeah. do. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, just kind of um, that always, to me, that was always like, uh, it's too hard. It's an hour's drive. i got to get a babysitter. But um, th that networking is invaluable because that's where you find that people aren't too famous or too special to share information with you. You will find somebody whether it's in a talk or whether it's the person you're sitting beside just don't be afraid to reach out to people even if they're too busy or too important to talk to you they'll direct you to the place to go yeah you can't sort of do it all by yourself <laughs> and also what's important is um a writing partner or, or a group you know like if there's three or four or five of you so flick the book club and join the writers group and you can then bounce your ideas off people. And um, there's one lady here in Woodend who's been fabulous for me. And she just says, keep going, keep going. Yeah, I certainly had people who would just like, it's a great story, keep going. You'll get there. 
So it felt like when this book came out, it felt like, wow, we've finally given birth to this project. And I can't imagine that another a subsequent book would have the same meaning. Um, so people have asked me, what am I doing next? And I haven't got a next project, but that's also a good answer to have up your sleeve is mm -hmm. what you're doing next. Yeah. yeah. Because, and someone else said to me, once you publish a book, things happen. And I said, what sort of things? And she said, I don't know, just stuff happens. You, know? you start, Liz Booker will be on the phone ringing you up, wanting you to talk <laughs> to the Americans. <laughs> exactly. Next thing, you're global. <laughs> that's right you're international that, that's yeah. all good advice i have i have two writing partners myself um one who i've had since i graduated from my writing program she was actually my roommate when we would do residencies there and when we were graduating we were like oh what do we do now we don't have an advisor to turn work into why don't we do that with each other and so we've been exchanging work for several years now and then a, a newer one from the same program graduated at a different time, but who lives locally. Um, and yeah, it's like the, they, especially, I mean, I think it's important, you know, if you have the time and ability to, to make yourself available to people at different levels and also be, you know, exposed to writers who are at a different level than you are, who can bring your writing up. But um, it, for me, it's really important to have, you know, people around me who have the language to give me the feedback that I need and who have, who can see where the problems are and be able to communicate those to me, um, to give me yeah. that critical feedback. So, yeah. That's really important. The other advice I was given at uni was use your networks. And so if you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who's a writer, then just make your way to that person, um, beg, borrow, or bully your way over there. And one of the first people I spoke to when I wanted to write magazine articles was my friend's father who wrote fishing articles. And he was trying to watch the cricket. And I came around and I was like, no, I have to talk to you about how am I going to get published and how am I going to do it? What am I going to do? And, and he was like, oh. you know, my friend said, oh, it's a big thing to interrupt him while he's watching the cricket. And I was like, I just need five minutes, you know. Um, and that got me going on to the next thing. Uh, and then he wrote some books. He wrote a fishing book and a, something else, you know. And um, so he was quite helpful as well with that. And, and when my book came out, he said to me, Dad said to say congratulations. And, yeah, it was nice. Like it was just a short conversation, but it was a very important one to me at that time. And I thanked him for it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I remember, you'll see my acknowledgements are about 10 pages long. Yep, I, I read the acknowledgement. I read everything. I read from cover to cover. <laughs> so yeah, okay. <laughs> always read the acknowledgements to see like- Yeah, together, yeah. So. I oh, wasn't yeah. interested in doing, doing the introduction. The editor pushed me to write the introduction. And um, I she think, said- I, I, know, I think it, it absolutely grounds us in sort of who you are and mm -hmm. your credibility to be writing about the topic it, it it actually like i think it was necessary i'm glad you wrote that yeah yeah it was a bit daunting in the beginning though because i didn't want to yeah. i said don't my voice is all the way through it i'm telling 10 stories isn't that enough and she said no write an introduction and put yourself in it will you and i'm like, she said i'm hoping you'll put yourself in it and i thought oh man this is so hard yeah, yeah, but anyway, it, was, it, it came naturally once I got going. Yeah, good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for this, Kathy. I really appreciate it. No worries, Liz. Thanks for having me on.